Amen. Ooh, goodness. Ah. <laughs> Amen. Oh. Mm. Ah. So our theme is about coming alive. And the question is, what is that coming alive? And there is that what makes you come alive. Yes. Amen. God, thank you. Thank you for this way that through our bodies and through our thoughts and through our spirits that we know that you're here and we can know that we're here together. Thank you for all the ways that you enliven us. Thank you for the ways that in this world with all the things that are distractions and difficult that we can know the wonder of your presence and we can know the wonder of your love. So God, I ask that all of us continue to feel that and take from these moments what we need to carry with us, to share, to hold, and to just know that we truly are worthy of your love. Amen. Mm. <laughs> Amen. Mm. <sighs> yeah, something just moved through there. <laughs> yeah. So our theme for this Lenten season is what makes you come alive and that, that's the question that we get to notice and the question can provide us with encouragement um, to notice and to reflect on our day in and day out habits and as well as these occurrences in our lives that just happen that we would consider maybe ordinary. And this includes um, as we've explored the times when we may feel overwhelmed or feel numb which is not what I feel right now at all uh, and numb is a feeling by the way and uh, also those times of very much feeling awake um, and, and maybe when we think we, we feel pretty balanced with the ebb and flow of the events that go through our lives and the ways we make meaning of those um, body, mind and spirit. So this time of ritual uh, that Lent provides and invites us to contemplation and prayer can also invite us and remind us to not forget to notice and recall when and how we have times of enlivenment. When are, when are we actually enlivened? And as we turn inward in contemplation, we might find out that we're praying to be more personally compassionate with ourselves or with others. Or we may experience times where um, we're thinking, I, I don't know what practice to engage in. But we still have this question. And I love it that this question is our Lenten question. We get to come back to this question, what makes me come alive? What makes us come alive? Whatever else is true, we can come back to this question. And we get to also ask the question, how do I know that? What does, how, how does this arise? How does it arise in my body? What do I notice? What happens in my mind? What happens in my spirit? So we get to be intentional about that. And this really is a question that um, I think generally doesn't get asked. So the Lent I think is about going to questions and reflection that maybe we typically don't have an opportunity to or aren't invited to and this question we get invited to. It may be that prayer and contemplation itself 
may, be a, may provide us with a greater sense of aliveness or cause us to remember times when we are feeling that sense of enlivenment. So our text today, the readings, and thank you again, Pamela, for doing the reading. Our text, in all of these experiences that we're having, remind us that we're not alone as we think and feel and wonder about these things. Our texts speak to the promise of divine covenant of belonging. All three of those texts in their way, again, let me say it again, they speak to the promise of divine in loving relationship with us, a covenant of belonging. So this message appears again in various ways in those texts. So let me start with the first one, the new covenant spoken to the people of Israel and Judah in the book of Jeremiah. And part of it says, I will be their God and they will be my people. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. I will forgive their wrongdoings and never again remember their sins. The covenant of belongingness with none of the people, whatever their status left out, nobody's left out, they all will know me. And so, again, a way of talking about belonging and all belonging, no one without exception. So that's the Jeremiah text, belonging, loving belonging with the divine. So the other, another, was Psalm 51. It says, create in me a clean heart, O gracious one, and put a new and faithful spirit within me. Enfold me in your arms of love and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Restore in me the joy of your saving grace and encourage me with your willing spirit. One of the translations talks about don't um, move me away from you. Don't push me away from you. So here we talk about us in belonging with the divine, a desire to be in belonging. So this is reciprocal. This isn't a, a one-way belonging. This is about divine in belonging with us and us in belonging with the divine. So a, a reciprocity to this. So as I prepared this uh, text uh, to share with you, I keep recalling the song, Give Me a Clean Heart and I'll Follow You. And I thought, well, we sing that here and I suddenly realized that song I've been singing my whole life. It came from when I was a little tiny child. I'm sure this song was um, in the church I was raised in. I was raised unbaptist, I call it. So the, 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 we sang that song every Sunday, I think. So a desire for belonging and a deep prayer in this psalm and hope that the belonging is possible through God's grace and God's love. So the third is a message from Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 12, and this is verse 26, part of verse 26, and it's one line. It says, where I will be, so will my followers. And I always say John has a way of saying, the, the writer of John has a way of saying really big things in very few words. And so, where I will be, so will my followers. So the writer of this gospel could bring in such a few words, these powerful options and opportunities, and then in this case, of belonging. So what makes you come alive can end up being a really powerful question for this season, I think, because the journey to the cross, crucifixion, holds part of the culmination of the embodied Jesus in this realm his suffering and his death. And it's so about life, about resurrection, about the living 
and modeling of love and justice that transcends power structures and affiliations and it refuses and it even eclipses terror and becomes a guiding way to belonging. It's a way to belonging. And it goes into communities and ultimately spiritual communities that become what we call the church. The church, where we're sitting right here, church communities of belonging that we aspire to ourselves, that we aspire to be hubs and parts of hubs of belonging, of loving belonging, of justice and connection. From those texts that we're talking about, about God, the divine of love and connection to who we aspire to be and who we are in these moments. So this question, what makes you come alive? It's so about life, spiritual mind and body, about encouragement and encouragement to live to the fullest as Jesus speaks in John 10.10, 10, I have come so that they might, and it always makes me cry, I have come so they might have life and have it more abundantly. Belonging and truly living it to the life to the fullest in the ebb and flow of our lives in this realm so that we can support each other and live life more abundantly. That I believe the God, the God of my understanding does not want me deadened in this life, in this life that I may grieve and I may have hard times and things may be difficult, but life to the fullest is not deadened in whatever ways I may be, the world may desire that I be deadened, but that I be enlivened and that we be enlivened. And that is the message of belonging. So that's the question. Does belonging make us come alive? And that is the question I want to ask you to take with you and hold and wonder about and work with. I invite you to do that. Does belonging make you, make us come alive? So, so I want to, for a minute, talk about belonging. So I, maybe you've been thinking as I've been talking, so what's, what's belonging? So because, you know, belonging is different things to different ones of us at different times. Words come up like acceptance when we talk about belonging. I want to be accepted, and I don't want to be accepted just by comparison. I want to be accepted for me. So that comes up very often around belonging. Um, how identification with a group, a person, um, an institution, uh, attachment, how much influence do I have, belonging. So those are terms that very often come up around belonging. And belonging definitely gets expressed in different ways. And so I don't want to say that belonging is simple. And yet it sure is important in terms of how we are together, how we feel about ourselves, and what makes us come back here together in particular, and what it means about how we are together. And belonging is connected to well-being. There is no doubt about that. And indeed, it's named as a fundamental need for human beings. And so it is really important. I would add that studies would indicate not only for humans, but for many of our siblings in the more than human world, it also is really important in ways we understand some of those ways and some of those ways we don't. The other thing about belonging is it's not static. Sometimes in relationships, in groups, in institutions, one may feel more belonging at times and less belonging at other times. So there is a thing about belonging being in progress and being aware of that. So all of that is present with belonging. So 
again, if you're asking yourself, so what do I think about belonging in terms of how I think about it? That's a great thing because this really is about beginning to think about that. I think this is one of the ways we stay engaged and how we contribute. Do I belong? How, how in what ways do I belong? So this message is about exploration and what's different about it, and I was talking, um, I'm looking at you, Canute. Um, I was talking between services about um, what it meant to prepare this message because I know this content in a secular context, talking about belonging, but have not spent as much time in a spiritual context because what does belonging mean again in relationship to the divine? A God who is present in belonging with me and wants to be in relationship and belonging with me. What does that mean, what does that mean belonging is? And so I want to give you a moment to think about that. So what is, the, what is belonging in relationship with the divine? for you as you think about belonging in relationship with the divine what is it for you and that may come up for you as words or may come up as a feeling and so let me just give you a moment to think about it if you're sitting next to somebody and you have an urge to say something Please feel free to do that. I said earlier, it's so good to talk in church, please. Uh, but just a moment. Again, what is belonging in relationship to the divine? The divine, belonging, loving relationship. Okay, so I'm going to count to 60. And I'm going to come over here and talk to Minister Deidre. My mic is on, so I'm going to talk really soft. Okay, finish your thought. Okay, thank you. That was probably about 120 seconds. So it, I, I, it, felt, it felt really good in the moment to go find that, um, that answer just in the moment. Um, and I would share with you, for me, it felt about just being able to rest into, uh, you know, rather than being so straight up and down, a, re a kind of a resting into. Uh, so you get to think about, again, and, and, I, and I said in the moment, because I don't think it necessarily is the same all the time because we have different needs in di at different times. And belonging, I think, we get held as we need to at different times. And so that's in the moment. So whatever came up, I want to encourage you to maybe think about happening in the moment. Uh, and maybe something different, even 10 minutes from now. Uh, but thank you for participating. So, if we believe in this divine covenant, this promise of belonging, 
the divine promise, the divine as part of belonging, just it being there. We might ask ourselves, how do we respond? How do I respond to that being there all the time, that being an option? And so I want to return to, for just a minute, John 12, again, our reading. And so there's a, a part here where there's an entry of two uh, folks that the writer of John talks about. And this is chapter, tw uh, verse 20. Uh, and it says, among those who had come to the worship at the Passover festival were some Greeks. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and put forth this request. Please, we would like to see Jesus. So I've heard this text from John and have always heard the entrance of the Greek individuals as a transitional tool, almost a literary tool, where they came in to get us back to Jesus speaking. And granted, to remind us that Jesus' ministry of love and belonging had extended outside his culture and communities to others, to the Gentiles. And also, it got us to Jesus speaking about the crucifixion, because that is the next thing that happens in the scripture. But I hadn't really, in the way that I did in this preparation, paid deep attention to what the Greek individuals said. And I really did this time. To Andrew and Philip, they said, or to, I guess, Philip initially, said, please, we would like to see Jesus. And one translation says, they went on and said, can, can you help us? So it really caught me this time and tugged at me. It wouldn't let me go as often as true when preparing the sermon. It's like I'm going this way, but Spirit says, no, you're going that way. So it kept dragging me that way. And so I paid attention to it. And I knew I, I read the translation and went and looked it up and, and really found over and over that this was not an angry, angry query on these per people's part. They weren't saying, hey, we want to talk to Jesus because we have a problem. It was not that. It was, we want to talk to Jesus as in, we're kind of interested in being followers. So we have an interest in finding out who this person is from a different place. So they were seeking belonging with Jesus. And so from that, a number of questions arise. So what have they heard that made them take this step or move? What led them to do this? To go and say, we, we, wanna, we wanna talk to this person. What were they risking? What kind of belonging did they think this was? And perhaps they were only seeking Jesus, but if not, what did they believe about the belonging and the community that, that they would be a part of? I wondered how did they feel as they were doing this? Body, mind, spirit, how did they feel? And in what state were they in as they arrived to see Jesus? How, how, what had been their discernment process? How were they? Were they already enlivened when they got there? Or did the enlivenment happen as they came through the door or got to the place where they said, we want to see this person? So they went in and they said, we want to see Jesus. So I would ask you, as I ask myself, would I, would you, in any way want to be them? Would you want to be them? I invite you to ask yourself, as I ask myself, would I want to see, meet, be with Jesus? Would I want to see and meet and greet 
the divine. What would I be bringing? My question to myself over and over again has been, would I be too busy? Would I be too busy to see, this, to see Jesus? Would I be too afraid? Would I be afraid of what was the feelings and thoughts that were arising for me in the experience? Would I be afraid of what was going on around me if I did it? What kind of belonging would I expect? And what would I want if I decided to see Jesus? What would I want? What would have made me do it? What would I want? And of all the questions, that's one of the questions for me that keeps coming back. What would I want if I were there? So a couple other things that I want to say as I bring this to a, what I call a non-close, because it's sure a non-close. So a few other thoughts arise around this encounter. And it's the scary part of belonging. Because what's called belonging can be scary. People belong in service to many things that can be dangerous and harmful. In hearing invitations to belonging, a question can be, um, is this a scam? Is this belonging conformity or hate? And if I get involved, can I be myself? Is there room in this relationship or group or community for me to be me? Belong suggests ownership. And for so many people, the world's been set up for centuries and millennia to have people belong to other people. Or struct things are structured so that some people have lots and lots of power over other people and control other people's lives to the point of their very breath. And so belong, what's called belonging raises questions that can be scary. Is there space to not be overpowered by individuals or a community? And what part of the community wields power? And who is that? And what are the imbalances of power and oppression that exist potentially in this community. And so a lot of communities that call themselves places of belonging that have those kind of imbalances actually have called themselves spiritual communities and communities of faith. And so to not say that would miss um, a real thing in the 21st century and I bet then too. So I think one of the things that is just as, as we get to discern and think about Jesus' teachings is that belonging, rather than demanding conformity or fitting in, can include a range of experiences. I'm now talking about healthy belonging communities, a range of experiences and bodies and perspectives and cultures with the fiber of connection being about mission and vision of love and justice. And it includes differences and similarities and conflicts that get worked through and discussed. And as they do, the community is strengthened and is more beautiful and more equitable. And the scriptures would indicate that in his time, in an incredibly enlivened way, in an incredibly enlivened way, because I went back and thought of scripture in an incredibly enlivened way that is accessible thousands of years later, Jesus spoke to and taught and lived and modeled for us these communities of belonging 
and love during his embodied presence on earth. And we get to, we get to notice that and do that. So the entire quote from Howard Thurman that appears in the program for our series is, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. So as we continue this time of Lent and move beyond it, the encouragement is to explore what experiences, what practices and people and causes and activism and breath and movement and songs and whatever it is for you make you come more alive. And the encouragement is to incorporate that and know that as you do, the divine and divine belonging and love truly abound in that experience. Amen.